If you want to hear what the best advice Wolfgang Puck, Gordon Ramsay, Bobby Flay, and other successful chefs have for how to make it as a restaurateur, then this video is for you. Just remember, you have to make always more money than you spend, and you will stay in business and you will always live okay. Key to a successful business is remembering the customer's king, because without them, we're nobody. And if you don't really love it, if you're not incredible, you, know, you hear the word passion thrown around all the time, there's no more important word than cooking. If you're not passionate about it, it's not the right thing for you. What's up, Believe Nation? It's Evan. My one word is believe, and I believe in you. I believe you have an amazing gift inside you that I want to see explode out into the world. Now, I started the Making It series to take a deep dive down specific industries, specific verticals and niches to get the best advice, the best knowledge, the best wisdom from the people who've accomplished the most in that field and distill it down into one video for you guys. So today, we're going to learn from some of the world's most famous chefs on how to make it in the restaurant business. Enjoy! All right, up first, number one is be consistent with Thomas Keller. And great restaurants have to be consistent. We can all cook. You know, there's a lot of great chefs out there who can do a lot of great things, but to be consistent 300 days a year, you know, lunch and dinner, over and over and over and over again, is really, for me, what defines greatness. It's the one, one hit wonders or one hit wonders. To be there for a long time, uh, to be impactful for a long time, to have um, a, a team that continues to evolve, to have guests that continue to come to your restaurant, to have that relationship with your partners or your suppliers. Those are really, really important things for me in a restaurant. Number two is don't live beyond your means with Wolfgang Puck. Was there someone earlier in your career that worked with you on helping you set up the businesses and teaching you the business side, or did you already have that knowledge? My mother, when I left at 14, she told me, you know, Wolfgang, just remember, you have to make always more money than you spend, and you will stay in business, and you will always live okay. And my motto was always like that. You know, let's not try to overspend. Let's not spend more than what we have. So when I first started Spargo, for example, uh, in 1982, in January, when we opened, we started with 26 employees. Five years later, we have 96 employees. And it was the same size restaurant, basically. Mm -hmm. But I started, everybody was working basically 16 hours a day. So little by little, I trained people and added people to it. But we didn't live beyond our means. Number three is focus on the customer with Gordon Ramsay. Key to a successful business is remembering the customer's king because without them, we're nobody. And so I, from a chef's point of view, always put myself in a customer's situation where I see it from their eyes. I don't cook for chefs. Every time chefs come into the dining room, the first thing to do is turn up the plates upside down and start photographing the food. And um, they're constantly, you know, dissecting the food as, a trying, as opposed to enjoying it. So I always look at it from a customer's perspective because they're king and without them, we're history. Number four is intersect art and commerce with Mario Batali. As a core of your business ideology, you have to figure out what it is that you can make that is perceived as value, as delicious, and as something you want to make. When I talk to all of my chef friends, what's important for all of us is to realize we need to live on the intersection of art, the food we want to make, and commerce, the food they want to eat. And if you can find that in the same vicinity, then you have a restaurant idea. If you just want to make stuff that makes you completely happy and your customers don't understand it, you do not have a business. You have a good place for you to express your art, but the most important thing is that it's a sustainable experience for both you, your staff, and your customers. So when you have that idea, I would say that in the next 20 years, what's going to become super important, there will be continued uh, a, a striation of super fine dining of the highest level. But what's going to really be your business model will be a more casual experience where people can eat fancy food Maybe without so many tablecloths or without so many 
fancy waiters and Riedel glasses. Not to diminish the greatness of what I perceive to be fine dining, because I love to go to fine dining, but I would say that more experiences are gonna be based on casual, less formal dining moments, and yet still quite fancy food. Number five, find your dream with Anthony Bourdain. Any advice for somebody looking to, to find what they love? Short answer on, on cooking is before you spend money on cooking school, go and work in a restaurant even for free if necessary. Work in a busy restaurant and, and, and you know, give yourself enough time to understand how hard it is, how little money you will be making, how long it will take you to pay back that student loan, uh, how, how just how difficult and unglamorous it is. Um, and, and, and how insane you have to be to, 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 to find a home. And, you know, there are two types of people, who, people who love the restaurant business and, and thrive on that sort of insanity and, and adrenaline and futility and, and, and inequity and, 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 sounds great. and pressure sounds in the heat. And then there really are good. normal people and you need to find out before you go to school. So I'm all for pursuing your dream, but, but I think it's a good idea to go find out early, you know, before you invest in that dream, either time or money, you know, find out what that means. Uh, you know, if there's a downside, uh, you know, I don't know how we all got this gig. You know, I, I think it was, yeah, I mean, I, you know, are you pursuing your dream? <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Number six, master your craft with Jacques Pepin. What do you think great cooks, is there a common thread? What are great cooks anywhere in the world, anywhere you find them, what do they have in common? Are there shared, is there a shared characteristic? What, do you, what kind of personality type is required to be a good cook, or, or is there such? Hard worker, consistency, you know, being there on time and all that too. All of that is extremely, extremely important. So that's one first level. Then the second level, if you have that type of commitment, then you learn the trade and you become a craftsman. And the craftsman is purely a question of rep repeat, you know? Do it over and over and over and over and over so that it kind of became part of your DNA. So that that the time you can afford to let it go, disappear, because now you can stand in front of an audience, talk, your hands are working, and you can think in terms of combination of ingredients or whatever too. That's the technical part of the food itself, to being a craftsman, you know, to, do, to, to be a technician. But I know a fair amount of very good technicians in the kitchen, which are relatively lousy cook. The food is never very good. So, you know, this is not the end of it, but it's a good start. But if you are the type of commitment that I talk, if you become a good technician, then if you happen to have talent, then you have the know-how of those techniques to take that talent and take it somewhere. And if you infuse a little bit of love in it, then you may get to extraordinary food. Number seven, question everything with Marco Pierre White. Your philosophy of cooking to me seems to stem from a, a very deep knowledge of the understanding and the science of food. Who, if anyone, was your mentor in the science of food or did you just pick it up from just getting in there and getting your hands dirty? Again, it's about questioning what you're doing. It's about understanding. If you, for example, take a tomato, and you cut a simple tomato in half, and you put half on the plate, and you put the other half under the grill, and then you eat the two tomatoes, you've got to ask yourself, which one tastes more of tomato? The one that's cooked. And then you've got to ask yourself, why does it taste more of tomato? Well, by cooking the tomato, what you're doing is removing the water content. By removing the water content, you remove the acidity within the tomato and allow the natural sweetness of the tomato to come through. So, and that's just a simple tomato. But if you take that same philosophy and that same understanding all the way through your cooking, you know, we're, we're not, I'm not a scientist, but you have to question why we're doing things and what's happening. Number eight, get your foundation right with Bobby Flay. When I started cooking, it was only thought of as a blue collar profession. I worked in a restaurant called Joe Allen's, which is right here in the Broadway district, it's still open. And as, I started as a busboy you know, when I was 17, and then I, I did that for two weeks, and I was sort of walking out of the restaurant, and the chef said to me, you know, if you want to work in the kitchen, there's a job, and I said, okay, fine. I mean, it wasn't like, I, yay, you know? <laughs> uh, and so I, and I started working in the kitchen. It took me a while to really understand that I really liked it. It took me about six months, and then I decided to go to culinary school. First, I had to go back and get my 
uh, my, my GED diploma to go to culinary school because I hadn't graduated high school. And, and so I've been cooking in my restaurants for 30 years. And to me, if you want to be um, an authority figure in anything, you need to be well-versed in that, in that role. Cooking is the same way. If you go to culinary school for six months, a year, or two years, it doesn't really matter. All that it was really giving you is a, an opportunity to get an entry-level job in the profession. Right. Period. Doesn't make you a chef. Right. Doesn't say, it doesn't, you can't, it doesn't mean you should be on top chef cooking <laughs> away, uh, although you know, that's what a lot of people want to do. I think it's really important to, to get the foundation of your profession down. And if you don't really love it, if you're not, incre- you, know, you hear the word passion thrown around all the time, there's no more important word than cooking. If you're not passionate about it, it's not the right thing for you because, especially in the restaurant business, it's long hours, a little bit of pay, but the payoff can be amazing in terms of um, just lifestyle, in terms of how, 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 how it changes your life. Not financially so much, I mean, maybe later down the line, but just it becomes part of your whole life. Number nine, stay ahead of the curb with Robert Irvine. When it comes to success in food service, you have to be open to that little world called change. And we don't like that. Over the years, I've seen the industry grow and reinvent itself so many times, I've lost count. Whether you're a restaurant owner, a chef, or anyone else that works in the restaurant industry, you need to stay ahead of that curve. Complacency has no place in the food service industry. It actually kills profitability faster than anything else. So we've got to adapt to change in our industry in order to keep our businesses relevant and our consumers engaged. But let's be clear, change doesn't have to be massive. It doesn't have to involve me showing up with a sledgehammer and a makeover crew. So let me summarize a few critical success factors, and they're pretty basic. Number one, Know what your customers want, not what you want. So just remember this, understanding the demographics isn't enough. You have to talk to your customers, your clientele, and get their feedback about what you're doing well and what you're doing not so well. Get on social media. How do people know about your restaurants? Anybody? How do they know about restaurants? A little phone, two taps or three clicks on that, they know about your food, they know about everything you have in your restaurant. The internet and with social media is taken the whole new world, you know, think about the word of mouth, the internet has taken it to a whole different level. There's no quicker way to search for a restaurant by menu, neighborhood, cost, and the biggest one, your reputation. So make sure you have an up-to-date profile on major uh, social media sites. It's the way to tell your story. And you'll hear this a lot today, your story. The whole idea of setting the table for success is to help you in all the areas you need help. I am a tech geek, just like Jeff, a convert. It was like the lights, the heavens literally opened up and went, ah! Because I used to do inventory control with pens and papers. I used to count money like this, write checks, no point of sale. This is the big one. Embrace technology. The restaurant industry is evolving quicker and quicker every day. And technology is changing the way we do business. And you need to adapt or risk losing your competitive edge. If you're not thinking about technology as a business strategy, well, you're already late to the game. The effective use of technology can make your business faster, leaner, and ultimately, it can help you deliver a better customer experience. And number 10, before we get to the bonuses, surround yourself with great people with Emerald Lagasse. Are you still, I mean, are you in contact with every restaurant every day? in some way, shape, or form? I sure am. How do you keep that up? I mean, that's... Well, I think that it's, um, you know, first of all, I'm very blessed to have the people that I have in my organization. And uh, I have people in my organization that have been with me since day one, Mm -hmm. or pretty much even before then. So pick a restaurant. 
Uh, NOLA. Safer. NOLA. Okay. Well, Avril Thompson has been with me 28 years. Mm -hmm. He's the general manager. And my chef there has been with me for 16 years. Josh, pick another one. Mm, let's say, uh, let's see, how Emeralds many Vegas? Orlando? Okay, Emeralds Orlando, okay. let's say. Okay. Just tip of my tongue. Gabriel uh, was with me at Commander's Palace, who's the general manager, the director of operations there. So he's been with me about 29 years. Mm -hmm. And Bernard was my pot washer at Commander's Palace, who's really? the director of culinary. No kidding. So. so you're a big believer in raising them up. How was your, Johnson & Wales, uh, yes. That's where you got your culinary training. Mm -hmm. Do you still hire people out of culinary school? I hear a lot of chefs say, I don't want another trust fund baby who went to culinary school who can't cook. I don't want to, you know. You know, when I interview young talent, um, I'm, I'm really looking for, I'm looking for heart, I'm looking for soul, I'm looking for passion. You know, I can teach somebody how to cook, but you gotta have the want mm -hmm. and the love and drive to want to cook. Mm -hmm. um, if you have that, then it's much easier to teach somebody. Can you tell in about five minutes into an interview whether you're gonna hire somebody or not? Yes. So you can, what's the main offender for somebody who is, uh, is there something someone can say and definitely not get a job with you? Well, you know, I'm not looking for people that um, are, are looking to necessarily build a resume, mm -hmm. although that's, you know, that certainly is a part of it. Um, I, I want somebody that really wants to, to learn and grow in the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not really, I don't really look for experts. I mean, I'm, I'm looking for people that really want to want to make people happy is the key in the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I can teach somebody how to cook, but wanting to cook and wanting to cook to make someone happy, mm -hmm. that's something that's rare that you can find. Mm -hmm. And when you see that, then that's what I'm attracted to. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'd love to know what do you think of this video? Who had the single best piece of advice that you are gonna take home and apply to your business? Leave it down in the comments below. I'm really curious to find out. I also wanna give a quick shout out to Michael from leadtheteam.net. Michael, thank you so much for picking up a copy of my book, Your One Word, and making the blog post and posting on your website. I really appreciate the support, man, and I'm so glad you enjoyed the book. So thank you guys again for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever your one word is much love i'll see you soon if you in your mind have decided that your career is going to be about feeding people you have to understand that there's one piece of that which is feeding people the other piece of that and there's three is that you're taking care of your family of staff in a way that allows them to feel as important in your world as is serving the customer. 20 years ago, I spent 100% of my time on guest satisfaction. Now I spend 50% of my time on guest satisfaction and 50% of my time on staff satisfaction. Because at the end of the day, you're only as good as your team is. And if they are not happy or if they're eventually just moving on quickly because they're trying to build their own little resume and go work for Gordon Ramsay and then go work for Daniel Ballou and then go work for Mario Battaglia and then do this and do that and all of a sudden, like they're just like spinning. What you really need to be is someone who totally gets both the integration of your staff happiness and your customer happiness. And when you understand that, then you can start a restaurant. Jonathan Benno here. I might, some of you may know Jonathan Benno. He began at the French Laundry in 1995. I'm sorry, 1996. Later became chef of Per Se. Today he has his own restaurant. Jonathan came to me as a young chef de partie. A chef de partie is an individual who works on a specific station. In this case, Jonathan was the fish cook. He came to me one day and Jonathan does this. He said, chef, he does that when he's making a point. He points at you with all four fingers and his thumb underneath. Chef, I mean, that, you know, you know he's serious. I'm, I'm not gonna have a cutting board on my station tonight. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm working, I mean, I'm busy. You know, it's back in the old days when, when everybody had a lot to do. And, and not that we don't today, but, you know. <laughs> I was more immersed in it. And I'm thinking, okay, whatever, you know, that's, that's interesting. You're not gonna have a cutting board on your station? Yes, I'm gonna be so prepared. I'm gonna be so prepared. I have so much confidence in my ability to have my mise en place done that I'm not gonna need a cutting board. Now, every chef de partie in every restaurant has a cutting board on their station. Some of them need a cutting board. The butcher needs a cutting board to, to carve the steak. Jonathan was doing fish, everything's in place, everything's ready to go. All he has to do is cook and serve it. I said, okay, that's fine. Don't have a cutting board. 
at the end of the service, flawless. It's become the new standard for that station because Jonathan Benno had the confidence and courage to step outside of what was the norm in any restaurant and say, I'm going to do better. I'm going to create a new standard. Wolfgang Puck, what I really love about you is you're still cooking every day. You haven't got too big for that. Why getting too big? That's the best part of my life. You know what? I cook for my family at home whenever we go home. A few times uh, my wife cooks. She makes good lasagna and good pasta and good Ethiopian food. When she does that, she's really good. She makes good Ethiopian coffee. But we don't live on that chest. If not, we would be really skinny. So I think I love to cook at home. I love to cook in a restaurant. I still go to the farmer's market. I go to the chain of farm. I go to the fish market. I'd much rather do that than going to Neiman Marcus shopping. And that's your passion, and that's, that's why you're so successful. I think so too. I think, and I was really wondering when I was younger, if I could keep that passion to still loving what I do and do it actually, you know, not just talking about it. And I think I'm so lucky that I still feel the same way about food, about restaurant, about people in general as I did when I started 35 years ago in the restaurant business. Raise your standard. Apple at the core, its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. Not one drop of my self-worth depends on your acceptance of me. I don't ever give up. I'd have to be dead or completely incapacitated. Hey, Believe Nation, if you want to see my all-time favorite top 10 rules of success, I have a very special secret video for you. These are the individual clips that I have personally learned the most from and applied to my life and my business. Check the link in the description for details.